people have been talking about the idea of uh, rewording, re if you will, um, a particular organism or even a particular species. Um, and for a long time, it seemed like the stuff of science fiction, but it's becoming more and more closer to reality. You may have heard of this term CRISPR. If you haven't, you're gonna learn all about it and you're gonna learn what it is capable of. It can be a, a controversial topic at times. People talk about designer babies, they talk about gene bombs. What exactly is CRISPR going to be capable of doing in the future? That's something we're gonna be talking about. What we can say is human beings are becoming uh, better at having control over their own bodies. But what exactly does that mean when you have technologies like CRISPR? We're gonna, we're gonna explain that, but before we get started with our panel, which is an incredible panel, I want you to watch this video to get a little bit of background. Perhaps few techniques in biology have stirred as much excitement and controversy as the gene editing technique known as CRISPR-Cas9, usually shortened to simply CRISPR. It allows genetic material to be added, removed, or altered faster, cheaper, more accurately and efficiently than other existing genome editing methods. Here's how it works. CRISPR is actually a technique borrowed from an ancient defense system bacteria use to defend against viruses. The CRISPR complex consists of a strand of RNA bound to an enzyme, usually the Cas9 enzyme, but some groups use a nuclease called CPF1. In the lab, scientists synthesize this RNA sequence called the guide RNA that will determine exactly where the gene editing will take place. Once in the cell's nucleus, the CRISPR-Cas9 or CPF1 complex bumps along the genome, attaching every time it comes across a small sequence called PAM. This allows CRISPR to grab onto the DNA so that the Cas9 or CPF1 enzyme can unzip just a little bit of the DNA double helix. That allows the guide RNA to slip in and sniff around to see if it's a match. If not, CRISPR moves on. But if every base of the guide RNA matches up with the target sequence in the DNA, it triggers the enzyme to cut the DNA in two right where researchers wanted. Now the cell's natural DNA repair mechanisms swing into action. Cells usually repair a break in their DNA by gluing the loose ends back together. That's a sloppy process that often results in mistakes. That may not sound useful, but if adding random bases or stitching ends back together disables or inactivates a disease-causing gene, then that's a desirable result. Just as revolutionary is the ability to insert a desirable strand of DNA into the newly cut double helix. A customized, lab-synthesized DNA sequence is introduced for the cell to use as a template as it repairs and reforms its double helix. Variations on the CRISPR technique can be used to treat genetic diseases, grow more resilient crops, and develop designer foods, drugs, animals, and even malaria-resistant mosquitoes, and more applications are being devised almost daily. But CRISPR can also create off-target mutations with unknown consequences, and editing sperm or eggs to generate designer babies with blue eyes, a high IQ, or Olympic caliber athletic ability may one day also be possible. Once again, science may be racing ahead of ethics and our understanding of the risks and societal implications of genetic manipulation. Okay, well, let's, let's dig in. We got a terrific panel. Uh, Katrine Bosley, uh, George Church, Samarth Kokarni, John Leonard and Dun King Pai. Thank you, welcome to all of you. Um, at the, at, let me, Katrine, let me, just, let me just start with you. At the end of that video that everyone just saw, uh, Max talked about the fact that ethics and all that uh, could be outpacing science here, the, the ethical questions and concerns about CRISPR. That's how the video ended, why don't we pick up there? It's a great place to pick up, particularly given the context of, of this setting. And you know, maybe as a starting point, any brand new technology is, is probably going to raise some ethical questions, but the technology in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It's, it's what we do with it. All of us, I think, on this panel have a lot of aspirations around applications to human health and, importantly, addressing diseases and needs of patients where there aren't good therapies today or perhaps no therapies today. So that's certainly something where, from an ethical standpoint, we have a lot of ethical frameworks in place. We have regulatory agencies like the EMA, the CFDA, the USFDA. We have you know, lots of international conventions. So there is a lot of uh, guidance that 
is absolutely applicable to the ethical application of this technology when it comes to human health and others as well. So certainly the technology raises important questions, but we're not starting in a vacuum. And, and from a regulation standpoint, the right amount of regulation, not enough, too much? What's your point of view? So we work in the area of trying to make new medicines. And so in the United States, that means the United States FDA, in Europe, the EMA, in China, the CFDA, and similar agencies in, in other countries. And it's a good thing that they are overseeing new technologies. We've certainly found them to be engaged, smart, capable, and, and having the right and proper authority. They want to see medicines get to patients, too. They're, they're trying to find the right balance of how fast to go, how, how slow to go. And I think they, you know, we can sometimes critique them. Did they go too fast and, or too slow in a given situation? Our view is, let's be proactive, let's engage with them, let's bring, it's our responsibility to bring very rigorous and thorough science. They, they can't do that for us, we have to do that. And then if we've done that, if we've engaged with that data in a transparent way, then th that's the opportunity to move things forward into clinical trials and hopefully eventually approved medicines. Uh, Pro Professor Church, a, a little bit of the backstory on CRISPR and, and how this came about. We, we got a glimpse of it in this video, but is, is the sense that this was a technology that then was in search of a use, or, or what, what do you think really drove it initially? Uh, I would say far from it. We had, uh, CRISPR is uh, just one of many ways of doing gene therapy and, and even gene editing, and so we were totally ready for it. Uh, we had uh, worked within uh, editing, well, gene therapy since year 2000 uh, uh, and more, and then gene editing, we had uh, zinc fingers and talons before that. And there may be things after it as well. So uh, in the press, you might, you might miss the fact that this is just one of, of many. Yeah. It, when there was gene editing before, um, is, is there and a... some of those are already in the clinic, too. And some of those are already in the clinic. Is, is, there, a, is there a way of, of contextualizing how much better this is? Uh, in terms of gene editing versus what existed before? Well, well, some people say that it's very inexpensive, but but they're all actually very inexpensive relative to the cost of a clinical trial. Um, the important thing is the efficiency, and that's a case-by-case, case, you know, it depends on the site and the, and the tissue and so forth, but on average, it, it looks like it's a little more efficient, maybe three to four-fold. And that can be the complete deal-breaker in, in curing a disease. In fact, we would like it to be four times more efficient. What, what, what got you interested, Professor Kolkarni, in this area? Um, I, I think, you know, not often do you go up uh, and disagree with Dr. Church, but I will do it anyways. Um, I think take long. <laughs> there are a number of gene editing technologies, but CRISPR is something that's captured the imagination of millions of people because it's so easy to do. Now, you can argue that there are other gene editing technologies, but there are sophisticated labs like yours that are able to use it, whereas CRISPR has become, gone into the hands of many. It's completely democratized the technology. In fact, there's 100 labs in China that are doing CRISPR, 1,000 labs at this point, or, or India. And because it's so elegant, what it is, essentially, it's a pair of molecular scissors with different barcodes, right? Before, when you had to do different edits, you needed customized scissors for each edit you're trying to do, and that becomes cumbersome and takes time. Whereas here, you have these scissors with the molecular barcodes, and you just change the barcode with every cut you need to make. And that, that gives it such versatility hmm. to attack so many different diseases in a very speedy manner. And that, essentially, the, the promise of the technology is what got me excited about, about coming to CRISPR Therapeutics. Uh, now the challenge is you have the technology, but how do you cr bring this in a high-quality fashion to make sure there's no risks to patients? And in fact, the first indication we're working on is, is beta thalassemia, which in fact is very prevalent in, in Italy. It's a Mediterranean disease. There are about 6,000 patients with, and children, often with beta thalassemia, that have a genetic defect in their hemoglobin. And so we're using CRISPR to apply it to that indication, but for the first few indications, it's going to take a lot of rigorous quality and time to make sure you're bringing it in a safe fashion to patients. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that point as well, but um, to make it completely safe, is that a reasonable goal? Absolutely. I think, I think with, with transformative technologies such as these, 
you, you have to bring it to a safety level that regulators are comfortable with, physicians who are actually going to be part of the trial are comfortable with. Now, what does that mean to make it fully safe? Because every drug you bring, such as a small molecule pill, will have off-target effects. And antibody will not only attack the, the protein it's supposed to, it'll have some off-target. It's just a similar thing. It's nothing special in that regard. And to Katrine's point, the regulators are well aware. You need to make sure that you're only cutting in the place you want to cut and nowhere else in the genome. And there's limits of detection of how low you can go. So to the limit of detection, you want to make sure they don't have any off-target. And, and just to be clear, when you said you, uh, you, you might disagree with the good professor over here, were you talking about in terms of how you contextualize CRISPR versus the gene editing t techniques before? I, someone described it to me as like maybe that it was a typewriter with white out in the past and now you have Microsoft Word. I, I'm sure that's a very simplistic sort of metaphor, but how, how, how do you, how big a deal is this really? Well, I think, and I think that's, that's what I was trying to get at, which is it is a, it is an improvement that's an order of magnitude better in my mind. And while the other techniques, you know, were able to make some edits, in fact, there were, you know, restriction enzymes in, in the 80s. Um, but but it's, it's an order of magnitude better. And because it's so easy to do and so many people can do it, it's improving at a rapid rate. You know, there are multiple applications with CRISPR. You can actually delete genes or you can correct genes or repair genes. And the rates of Correcting genes just two years ago were about 5% or less. And because so many labs are working on it and so many companies are working on it, we're now at 50, 60% correction. And that's what I mean is sometimes your technology doesn't have to be two orders of magnitude better. If it's, it's better enough where it captures the imagination and the resources, it's going to dramatically accelerate it relative to other technologies. Well, um, John Leonard, if, if you're really good at being able to, to splice out a particular gene using this technology and in the way that Smart is describing, it's, it's safe to do it that way, it, doesn't it presuppose that you know all the impacts of taking out a particular gene? I mean, it, we, we would have to know a lot about the impact uh, of all these genes, right? <clears throat> well, it's important to know a lot about it, that for sure. And I, I think that's why we're beginning where we're beginning. I mean, if, if you look at a lot of the work that's going on right now, it tends to be in uh, monogenic disorders, diseases where a single gene contributes most of the pathology, or when we're rewiring a cell, for example, a very specific gene that has a you know, particular effect that we know a lot about. We're not looking for uh, complex disorders where there's uh, interactions that, uh, you know, between many different genes to get to some particular behavior of that cell. Uh, we're trying to make it as simple as possible to start. Now, I think this will evolve over time. We will learn, uh, but, you know, these are early days, and, and uh, we're, we're starting, I think, from a platform that's been well worked out. I, I know you, you, everyone on this panel talks about these issues a lot. Um, and, I, and I'm sure you've read, uh, there was a New York Times editorial not that long ago specifically saying, hey, look, you look at something like sickle cell, for example, and if you take out the gene for that, that was something that used to be protective against malaria. Um, cystic fibrosis, <clears throat> protective against the plague. Obviously, uh, you know, there's other ways of, of dealing with malaria, and we're not in the middle of a plague, but again, the downstream effects, even of a single gene, um, how much, do we, do we know enough to be tinkering in this fashion? I think we have to be selective uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, sickle cell disorder. Um, we're not worried about the malaria protection today. We're worried about the pathology that comes from the sickle cell that is a, frankly, very poorly treated condition. Uh, there is tremendous morbidity and even mortality, and, and we understand exactly what that, what that is caused by. And uh, one of the uh, beauties of that particular example is that there's experiments in nature that already exist where there's humans walking around with the uh, mutation that we're attempting to create that guide us in terms of what to expect for outcomes. So that's a, that's a helpful uh, first one. Uh, Professor Pai, the, can you talk me through what this might look like uh, for, for a, from a patient's perspective? I think this may turn out to be the cheapest uh, drug to develop for certain diseases, like rare diseases. And uh, in a traditional way, you won't 
probably not even able to develop for, say, small molecule therapy or even a uh, large like antibody or protein therapy. Because this is very precise if you do it well. And then, as the video already pointed out, is say we're in a very early stage, and we have to develop a lot of tools to quantify each step. And once we learn those tools, and we should be able to deploy this technology in a very precise fashion to help patients. And, and you know, uh, not, not to be too simplistic, but what would a patient actually go through, though? I mean, what, what, what would... Oh. So uh, it depends on the conditions for, uh, say, beta thalassemia. Uh, the target cell is very clear, is the hematopoietic stem cell. And then uh, if we design, or based on the sequence of the patient, we design a very specific uh, targeting tools to th uh, towards that uh, target. And then we have ways to uh, QC and QA, the, how the process really been through. And then we evaluate yeah, whether the patient improve or not, and uh, on a very individual basis. Uh, I think we were, we have all the technology available. I think based on what we know in transplantation, and it's just a matter of developing the tools. And uh, those gentlemen, three of them, uh, the the three companies, that I, I'm sure they're working on that. And we in China were working on this from an academic perspective because we don't have companies on mm. uh, gene okay. editing yet. Uh, we have large population in southern China, uh, as far as like 70% of certain villages are affected by uh, uh, beta thalassemia. It's a big uh, public problem yeah, for us. Yeah, maybe uh, another way of thinking about it would be you can really put it into two groups. Uh, one would be those conditions where you can take a cell outside the body, manipulate it, and put it back in. And I think the simplest, uh, most straightforward example of that is going to be cells from the bone marrow cells of the immune system or uh, cells that turn into blood cells, as we talked about sickle cell. The other uh, way to do it, which is more complicated, is to take the technology into the body, where you actually deliver it probably with a direct injection or an IV infusion. And there the challenge is uh, you have to target that technology somehow, typically with a virus or some uh, chemical delivery uh, technology that takes it to the cell or cells of interest, and then it gets in and does its editing at that point. So inside, outside. And do that? Do is there? I mean, did the patients experience anything? Do they feel anything at that point? I mean, what what what, what do they experience? <laughs> I, I, I'm, well, I'm we asking. Done like, it yet. Um, <laughs> no, uh, well, what what would they experience? What what is the concern about uh, side effects or anything that that uh, I mean, I, would they feel? I, would there be I, a reaction to this in any way? Or? I, I can only speculate based on animal work thus far, the typical preclinical program that's done. And uh, you can do this uh, quite readily, quite easily, with animals showing no signs of distress, no problems. You know, at some point, you can put too much in, you know, with your formulation, et cetera. But when you uh, uh, target it properly and give it at, at the right levels, that's extremely well tolerated. I think you know, it'll be interesting when you take cells outside the body, you're going to oftentimes have to give them space to go back into. So there may be some additional therapies that are necessary to do that. But by and large, uh, we expect this to be very well tolerated. Uh, Katrina, you, you talked about the, the, re the regulatory me mechanism around this. Is this a, is this a drug? I mean, is it, should this be regulated like a drug? It is essentially a drug. It's, it's the category, the broad category is a, a biologic, and that's what we tend to, a word we tend to use when it's not a synthesized chemical, but rather something where living entities are part of how you produce it. So in, in these cases, you know, as John was saying, if you're working outside the body where you are editing the cells outside the body and then giving that to the patient, then the medicine is a cellular medicine. There's a wide variety of what those could, could look like. Um, if you're working inside the body, you are delivering a, a biological entity. It might be, for example, a virus, and inside of that virus are the editing, is the editing machinery. The point of the virus is because it's very good at getting that editing machinery inside the cells that you're trying to edit, the cells that are driving the disease. But the physical thing that you're delivering to the patient, in that case, you're delivering a virus, and inside is the DNA for the editing machinery. So. Professor Church, what, what do you think is, is the, I guess, the most misunderstood aspect of CRISPR? Uh, 
Well, I would say that, that, that it's easy um, <laughs> <laughs> and efficient. This is going to uh, go back and forth, I yes. can tell. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we would love to take credit for uh, it being easy and democratized, and it is certainly around the world. Um, but most of these things, you, you basically ask a company to make it for you. Very few people make it themselves anyway, and it's about as easy to make one thing as another. Another thing I think that's misunderstood is this concept of, of enhancement. I think some of the major uh, applica early applications of CRISPR that will not be in any way overlapping of what you can do with genetic counseling, which handles a variety of rare diseases, will be <coughs> dealing with infectious diseases. And that is a form of, of enhancement where we are far superior to our ancestors in that narrow regard, which is we're resistant to, to smallpox and most of us, you know, as the previous session said, 20 different diseases. So I think that that will be a big impact. CRISPR will handle the ones we can't handle with vaccines. Um, those would, that would be my top two. So do, you, do you draw a parallel then between vaccinations uh, to try and prevent infectious diseases and CRISPR? I think CRISPR can handle a few things that cannot be handled by vaccines right now, notably HIV, hepatitis, maybe herpes. Um, those, those will be something that will not be impacted by better genetic counseling. Better genetic counseling is coming very quickly, too, and it's very cost-effective. So, Martha, is, is, this, is it gene therapy or, or, or gene editing? How, how do you, when you're explaining it to people, how, how do you explain, is this a form of gene therapy, then? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, CRISPR can have two embodiments, as John is explaining. In one case, it's ex vivo, where you're taking cells and putting cells back as a therapy. So in that case, it, it's a cell therapy. In, in another embodiment that Katrine was talking about, you're putting the machinery into a virus and you're delivering the virus back into the patient. And that embodiment, it's a gene therapy, right? So, so in some ways, you know, you have both cell therapy and gene therapy. I think what you might see is that some of the you know, there may be other ways of delivering it in, you know, polymeric particles uh, that don't include, use viruses, uh, lipid nanoparticles, et cetera. But broadly, they would still fall under these two, two uh, modalities, cell therapies and gene therapies. Does, does it matter to, to, that we define it precisely this way? Um, well, I think, I think um, ultimately to the patient, it doesn't matter, right? I think what you're doing is giving a therapy that can potentially be curative, and it's a one-time dose. Now, from a regulatory standpoint, it's important for, for us as companies, it matters because you may have different sets of hurdles uh, associated with uh, how you think about gene therapy versus cell therapies. With cell therapies, when you take pa cells from a patient or from some healthy donor, you process them with these molecular scissors and you deliver back to the patient, you have supply chain, you have logistics, you have to freeze these cells, transport them, uh, sometimes across the continents. And so in those cases, you have a different set of challenges. With gene therapies, you have, you know, some other things to worry about. You have to worry about pharmacology. When you deliver this into a particular organ, does it get into all the mm -hmm. cells? Does it, you know, how many of these viruses do you get in per cell? So there are technical differences in how we approach it from a drug development perspective. But ultimately to the patient, it should look like a one-time potentially curative therapy, uh, so it won't matter uh, for, from that angle. And actually, if, if I could add, particularly going forward, the lines are really blurring across these categories that historically were maybe relatively clear. So we even argue amongst ourselves, is that a gene therapy, is it a cell therapy, is it a this, is it? And so I could completely understand why this is confusing, and, and I think, you know, Sam made a very good point, which is hopefully for the patient, it won't be so confusing. It's mm -hmm. here's the, the method that we hope will treat your disease. The common factor is really medicines that work at the level of DNA and, and where our understanding of DNA is really the underpinning. And, you know, as a society, we made a tremendous investment in the initial sequencing of, of the genome, thanks to Dr. Collins, amongst many others. And, you know, that really provides us a foundation for all of these kinds of medicines to emerge. But, but the lines are blurry. Where, where are we uh, in the trajectory of things, would you say, uh, John? I mean, it's, it's, it's been in animal studies. I mean, how, how quickly could we see this available? Well, available in different forms, right? So just some 
point of context here. I mean, these companies here have existed for four to maybe five years, if, if that. So this is all very new, right? And uh, there's certainly no example of an approved therapy. Uh, uh, we heard a little bit about maybe cells that have been altered using CRISPR technology that are in patients, but in the, and that's in China primarily, but in the US and the EU, there are still no examples of patients being treated with this technology. That's about to change, and whether it's the next few weeks or months, depending on the company, for sure, in the next one to two years, there will be several clinical trials underway, both in the ex vivo and probably in the in vivo sense. And, and do you have an, can you anticipate what specifically those trials will be focusing on? Well, each company has its own uh, approach. And in, in, in the case of Intellion, I'll let the others speak for themselves, uh, we're working on both the in vivo and the ex vivo front. Our first uh, target is an aberrant uh, gene that express, a gene that expresses an aberrant protein uh, from the, the uh, liver that causes amyloidosis. And so it's a wonderful tar target to knock out. That's called TTR amyloidosis. So that would be an in vivo example where you give an IV infusion and try to disable that gene. On the ex vivo side, uh, like uh, much of the engineered cell therapy that's underway right now, we're trying to manipulate lymphocytes in a very specific way to go after specific tumor targets, persist, uh, so that they're able to go and you know go where no chemotherapy goes today. I want to move on in a second, but are we talking about halting the progression of a disease? Are you talking about curing a disease? What would be the outcome if, you know, in a best case scenario? Yeah, I think it's going to be very much dependent on the physiology of the underlying disease. So in the case of, say, sickle cell, uh, you'll have accumulated infarcts, deficits, et cetera, for the disease up to that point. But in theory, one should be able to stop that and cure, essentially, the behavior of those red blood cells. And something like amyloidosis that we're talking about, if you have accumulated protein over 20 years of buildup, for example, it's hard to imagine that all that's going to go away. But I think it's entirely reasonable to expect that you know, the progression of that disease will, in fact, stop. Duan King, I, I'm, I'm curious about in, in China. You heard Katrine sort of describe regulation in the United States, um, sort of seems to be, from her perspective, on, on the mark. What, what about in China? So, <clears throat> so in the, uh, the current regulation in China is that we have uh, two categories of uh, experimentation. So the... Uh, as a professor in an academic institution, and uh, he can apply for IRB to perform certain uh, experiments and uh, clinical studies, what we call them. And then based on the outcome of the study, and then uh, the institution then go for CFDA clearance of clinical trial. So those are the two tier regulatory framework we have in China at, at this stage. So that applies to stem cell therapy and also applies for gene therapy. In this case, CRISPR-Cas9 will fall into the category of uh, gene therapy. And, and do you... So the, the reports you've been hearing are, I believe, uh, investigator-initiated IRB-approved uh, clinical studies. And, and for, from your perspective, again, I, I, I realize it's your point of view, but the... Yeah. Is it the right amount of regulation? Do you think it, it, it gives you some comfort as a scientist? Does it hinder you? Does it help you? How, how do you look at it? Uh, I think collectively we feel okay uh, because so far it hasn't really been any adverse effect uh, affecting the patient, you know, for the protection of the patient. And uh, they have been discussing among uh, the regulators to sort of uh, mostly in response to Western criticism, I suppose, or a news report, <laughs> and to tighten it up. And uh, I think they are, uh, so far as I know, there haven't been any uh, further action uh, against those. So. The, the, uh, the, uh, personally, because yeah, I think you have to judge them by, uh, case by case. So the IRB process goes through a panel of 20-some plus uh, professors, outside uh, lawyers, you know, advocates. And if they clear a study, 
And that will satisfy the administrators, and uh, in most cases, regulators as well. Okay, great. We'll come back to that, I think. Um, Katrine, what, what, what got you interested in, in this particular area? Oh, it's the biggest thing that happened in biology in a generation. Um, I, I personally, I've worked in the biotechnology industry for almost 30 years. I've worked in many different disease areas, many different kinds of technologies. And, you know, I, I remember first hearing about CRISPR in 2011 or 12, I can't remember, and thinking, oh, that sounds much too good to be true. I mean, the idea of gene editing has been around ever since we understood the sequence of DNA and, and the understanding that a mistake in DNA leads to disease. Well, gee, if you could go in and fix it, that would be a very compelling concept, but that was quite literally science fiction. There were, there were these early technologies like zinc fingers and like talons that where people could, with great labor, and if you were a, truly an expert in gene editing and you spent your whole career doing just that, you could, you could make some changes. But the idea that there was this, this much more easily applied way to do gene editing that was also much more flexible. You could do many kinds of edits. You know, there are, there are 6,000 or so genetically defined diseases different mutations. The mistakes in the DNA have different structures. Some are small, some are big. And different kinds of mutations need different kinds of repairs. It's, it, you need to be able to apply the technology in different ways. And you can imagine different degrees of difficulty, a spectrum, right, where some kinds of edits are simpler, more straightforward, and some but much more complicated. All of us are, are you know, you start on the technically feasible end of the spectrum. And as you learn from that, how do you do it efficiently? How do you do it specifically? How do you deliver? That creates great leverage to then be able to tackle some of the more complex and challenging edits. And so this, that this world is now, we're at the beginning of scientific reality, not science fiction. Seeing that in that sort of 2011, 12, 13 time frame, uh, you know, it was really a no brainer as to what I was gonna do next. But when when uh, Professor Church, when when you think about this, and and based on what Katrina is saying, if if it gets more complex, I don't I don't know if that means that beyond single gene mutations, we can start to address multiple gene mutations or, or whatever it might be. Is is there a limit to this? Do you think? I mean, is there a point where you say that's that's all that we can really do in terms of altering one's DNA, or or is this is this limitless now because we have this tool? Well, I think both the word limited and limitless are problematic words. Uh, I mean, l l to put it in perspective, there, there are practical uses of making not one edit, which is what most of uh, the panelists here would be making as their product. But for example, I have another company called eGenesis that's making about 80 edits uh, to the pig genome so that you can transplant organs from, from pigs to humans. Uh, uh, th there's a reason to do a large number, and those organs might be slightly enhanced again uh, so that they do their job of replacing uh, uh, a diseased organ better. They, they could be resistant to the pathogens that killed the original or or organ, for example. Um, so there are purposes for doing large number of edits. We need to get much better at it. Um, as part, that, so I'm coming from a slightly different world. That's why I, I can complain about otherwise perfect and beautiful technology. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, Sam, do, do you see a, a limit? I know you don't like that word, but do, I mean, and, and how do you draw the lines then between treating one of these diseases, as Katrine's talking about, versus I think what people may debate but, but agree upon ultimately is an enhancement? Yeah, I, I think there are two ways to look at multi-gene editing. Uh, we're actually in our pipeline doing something today that involves multiple edits. You know, what we do to cure cancer, potentially cure cancer, is take lymphocytes or T cells, your body's white blood cells, engineer them to go attack the cancer. So, you know, a lot of us, we, you know, our immune system is very important in, in cancer prevention. You know, a lot of times we're exposed to cancerous elements, but because we have a strong immune system, we don't, they don't actually develop into a cancer. What if you harness the power of our white blood cells to attack the cancer? Now, we can do that with a single edit sometimes, where you just put something called a car that attacks the cancer. But what we're doing is a more sophisticated version where we, we accessorize these 
soldiers to, you know, just white blood cells to make them super soldiers to attack the cancer and kill the cancer, right? So that's one form of multi-gene editing, but it's contained, right? So that's why the, I like the analogy of it's, it's not limited, mm -hmm. but it's contained in some way. There's also diseases that are multi-gene or polygenic, as you call it, where you know, it's not clear, a lot of some of the metabolic diseases are that way, it's not clear that altering one gene in the pathway does lead to the, you know, curing the disease. It may lead to some reduction of sequelae or symptoms, but doesn't, may not cure the disease. And that one is not limited as much by the technology of CRISPR, but by our understanding. Of the, gene, of the genetics. In, in fact, you know, our, our understanding, because the Human Genome Project has already gone well beyond where we were 10 years ago, but we're still learning about some of these diseases. And once we learn how, to, how the different genes interact, we may be able to use CRISPR to do multi-gene edits in the same, same sort of form, either gene therapy or cell therapy. John, do you think that this is going to become a, a standard of care someday? I mean, I, I know it's hard to predict the future, obviously, but baked into that question is its effectiveness, but also its people's access to it, the cost, when you take all that into account. I think there's a time frame that you have to consider, right? So I could imagine it being absolutely a standard of care for sickle cell anemia in short order, if, uh, depending on the success and some of these other disorders that are, we're, we're pursuing. If you step out further on the benefit-risk balance, if you will, meaning there's uh, diseases for which we have some treatment, but it's not great, um, or it's a disease without so much morbidity or mortality, then the, the calculation changes in terms of what we need to know and, and the number of patients that we need to treat and to build some kind of a safety database. But that, in my opinion, that's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. and, and so whether that's measured in decades or you know, several or fewer, I don't know. But it's going to be up to, I think, how we start, the success that we have, the care that we take, not overreaching, et cetera. And you know, if, 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 if one wants to imagine a future far down the road, it is possible to imagine circumstances where you're altering risk factors for certain diseases. But in my mind, as, as attractive as that might be, if, you know, and if you get the cost down, et cetera, you might have wide availability to it. There's a ton of information that we need to know on, on the performance between now and then. And in, in my mind, that's measured in decades. Can, can you give me an example? What the, so preemptively trying to use CRISPR to decrease one's risk factors for a certain disease. What, 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 what does that mean? Well, think of it this way. Uh, if, if you take Sam's example of cancer, right? The patient has the disease. Uh, if there's not some intervention, this may be a particularly morbid condition, the patient will die. Right, so uh, you are treating the one patient in, w in which all of the risk and all of the benefit resides. If you have some condition which uh, could develop over time, but you don't know in whom that will develop, that may mean that you treat some people who never get the disease. So you're now treating three people to protect one or, or so on, okay? And in my mind, that's, you know, that is some of the speculative stuff that goes on in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the uh, area. But uh, again, with time, you know, as you deconstrain the timeline, that sort of stuff becomes possible. You, you, all, everyone on this panel uh, is obviously, they're all familiar with CRISPR. It's something that you've been thinking about. What is the perception, I don't know, if, 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 John, if you have a, a thought on this, but the perception in the medical community at large about CRISPR, how, how, how is it being taken or perceived? Uh, I think it really depends who you talk to. Um, if you talk to an oncologist, they're right there with you because they understand it. That is the vanguard, you know, the wavefront of exactly what they're doing, and they can see immediate utility. And so um, that would be one group where this makes perfect sense. Uh, there's groups who know the technology, if applied properly, could solve really important problems that they confront. So yeah, the neurologists, would, when they see CRISPR, they think Huntington's Korea, they say, I know how to make that disease better if I can get it there, and that's the, the challenge. And then as you move away from conditions like that, where you're dealing with you know, well-understood uh, genetic conditions, it becomes uh, more lay-like, I would say, in terms of the knowledge base. 
And, and how about in, in, in China? First, among the lay public. I mean, I think you were, you were sort of saying that there's been news stories that have, uh, may have influenced people's perceptions or thoughts about CRISPR. Uh, do people understand, does the average person understand CRISPR? I don't think so. Uh, but <clears throat> we have a, uh, as pointed out by some panelists, who have a large community of scientists a uh, basic scientist like me uh, try to use this great tool uh, to understand biology. I think that's still, in my mind, uh, the main story. I think if, if you just flip any journal and there will be so many publications out of China and using these great tools to enhance our knowledge on um, basic biological processes. Uh, even for the, you know, the embryo editing, I even wrote an article uh, in Cell Stem Cell advocating that uh, this is not really for heritable editing, it's actually a great tool for us to understand how our embryo develop. Mm. I mean, we still have a huge gap of knowledge that we don't even know much about. So I think the debate, and also I think George pointed out, and uh, I just want to remind everybody, uh, CRISPR therapy is very different from chemical therapy and even from antibi antibody therapy. It relies on a biological process that the DNA had to be bind into another, or the, the RNA need to bind to the DNA to confer specificity. And they require enzymatic activity and for the repair, which may or may not be the one you intended. So there's a, a, a lot to understand the whole process. <laughs> But I think I'm very hopeful that you know, through scientists all over the world, we can really uh, pin down on the whole process and make the whole process more efficient, and then, then everybody will benefit from this particular process. Katrine, the, the idea of diagnostics, using this as a diagnostic tool versus, versus a therapeutic tool, uh, helping increase or even increasing our understanding of, of the genome. Uh, how much of that, do, do you think of that, that is an important point of what CRISPR is going to do for us? You know, one of the exciting aspects of this field is how many different ways people are using CRISPR. And, and CRISPR, there are different molecules. That, as the video mentioned, there's Cas9 and CPF1, and there are actually other forms of CRISPR molecules people are finding as well. So in the, in the basic research community where they're really exploring CRISPR biology, they're finding new ways to apply it. So people are creating engineered forms that create different kinds of changes to DNA. They're using it to look at not only editing DNA, but editing RNA. They're using it in diet. So there's a multiplicity of, of applications. And I think that the, at the basic research level, uh, part of what is exciting is you don't have to spend many years learning how to do gene editing in order to use this tool to apply it to a biological question that you have spent years learning. So it means that mm -hmm. people with expertise in many, many, many different kinds of biologies can kind of pick it up. And I've had, I've had many scientists say to me, I tried it, and my first experiment worked. And anybody who's ever been in a lab knows you don't say that about old technology, let alone new technology. And I think that's the, the, the to me, one of the most exciting things is it, it allows inquiry into biological systems in a way that we're just beginning to see the impact because it, it, it reframes what questions can even be asked. That is all basic research, but I think it feeds that knowledge that I think either Sam or John was talking about. You know, how do we know what to go after? Well, we know some things now based on our knowledge of the genome, but as we understand the genome more deeply, it's going to open up more opportunities as we perfect the tool of how to edit as medicine. Our knowledge simultaneously is deepening about what could be helped with a better tool. Uh, Sam, when, when you were, you're, you're the CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics. When, when people are hearing all the things now, uh, have a better understanding of what CRISPR is, what it can do, what did you decide to focus on? Uh, uh, was there a particular area that CRISPR Therapeutics really wanted to address? Yeah, and, and I'll, to your previous question too, of how many people actually understand CRISPR, it's a bit like uh, Bitcoin. You ask everyone and say, oh, I know what Bitcoin is. But then when you really ask, you have people don't actually fully understand it, to Dr. Pay's point. And so, you know, I think, you know, I would, I, when we made some of the decisions we made three years ago about what can we use CRISPR, I, I will admit there was a bit of 
you know, serendipity and, and luck involved in, in picking the indications. Um, and, and we said we're trading off different things we know and don't know about the technology. You know, is it a good cutter? Is it, can it be delivered? Can it be, you know, can it actually be very specific? And, and, and we said, okay, let's, let's start with something that's a real problem for patients. And in this case, we chose beta thalassemia and sickle cell as our first indications. We know what the genetics are of the disease. So we don't have to go and study the disease more. Um, we know it's a real problem. But then the approach we use is an elegant approach where it's, it's uh, nature's study, essentially. So in Greece and, and Corfu and some of these places, people observed populations that had the genetics of sickle cell or thalassemia, but they're walking around normally. Mm -hmm. And they were not athletes, but they were, they were essentially did not have any symptoms. So I said, what's happening there, right? And they had a different mutation that made them protective against the sickle cell mutation. So we said, why don't we use CRISPR to recreate that mutation, right? So that way we have some evidence from nature that that strategy works. So that was the basis for how we picked thalassemia and sickle cell. Um, and then we picked cancer because it's a big problem we wanted to work on. But I think, you know, I have to say some of this, you know, uh, when early days you don't really know which diseases are more tractable versus others. You have to take, take some chances and pick some to work on. And over time you, you understand the technology more. It, it's, it's an interesting point, uh, especially the, the point you make about sickle cell anemia. And Professor Church, I, is this accelerating what nature would do anyway? I mean, is, 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 I mean, nature makes some good decisions. It created this other mutation to protect against some of the, the, the consequences of sickle cell. Uh, is, is, is CRISPR essentially an, a tool to accelerate that process? Well, so some of the things that we will be applying it to are not necessarily the same things that natural selection has acted on. So, uh, you know, almost all of our agricultural enhancements are things that were actually selectively disadvantageous in the wild. Uh, you know, being able to provide meat to humans is not, you know, at the, re at the reduction of, of ability to fly is not, is not a good thing in the wild. And the same thing happened, you know, uh, aging reversal is may maybe something that there's a reason that mice live two years and bowhead whales live 200. So that's why there's an opportunity for us to make giant advancements. Uh, we don't necessarily have to understand the entire entirety of the natural variation because we can do something completely novel. So for example, there are a whole variety of diseases that are treated with somatotropin uh, that affects your, your height. Um, that don't involve the vast number of currently not fully understood things that affect height, including environmental influences. So sometimes there's a simple solution to a very complicated problem. I, I guess the, the thing that I keep driving at, and, and just, just to continue for a minute, Professor Church, how do you, how do you decide when we are tinkering too much? I, I, I don't know a better way or a more eloquent way to ask that question, but Katrine talked about the regulation and, and, and the utility of it, but for scientists, how do you think about this? Well, I'm going to have to not be a scientist to answer that question, because I think scientists, many scientists, don't even care about the FDA, okay? Uh, I, to answer that question properly, you have to go beyond what the FDA concerns with. The FDA concerns itself with safety and efficacy, and relatively short term, they will let drugs like Biox on the market, and in previous generations, thalidomide. I think what you need to worry about is very long-term consequences, multi-generation consequences. Like hypothetically, smallpox might have been something that we needed somewhere in our population for something. But still, still, it's, the jury's out uh, after all these years. Um, so long-term, but there's more than just long-term. There's e equitable distribution. The FDA does not concern itself with that. There are uh, commoditization of our relationship with our children. Um, even if we don't do germline, we are, we are making decisions about our children's health um, that, we, that might turn them into products in a certain sense and put a, make us susceptible to commercial um, uh, uh, creating needs where there aren't needs, creating wants right. where there aren't wants. So those would be my list of things that are not addressed by the FDA and probably shouldn't be, but they should be addressed by society. Maybe this society right here. Right. Well, we're, 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 we're almost out of time, but, but just 
Sam, do, do you, is this something that you think about in addition to thinking about the potential therapeutics and the utility of CRISPR? At what point do we think we are maybe tinkering too much? Um, how do you approach that, especially when you're in, you know, the CEO of a company that's doing this? Yeah, I think, and I'll, I'll speak for all the CRISPR companies here. We've taken a very responsible and somewhat conservative approach on this, in this regard because, you know, when there are so many diseases you can cure or potentially cure that are right there that can actually give people um, a, a more productive life but a more, you know, pain-free life, for example, uh, or prevent death, you know, we go after those first while the technology matures and evolves because we can start in, in, you know, in, in a lab, you can tinker with many genes, but as companies, we have to do this in a more responsible fashion and a very high quality. So I think, I, I think that's what you'll see from all the CRISPR companies that have taken that responsible approach. I think you will have upstarts that want to push the boundaries based on a you know, commercial opportunity and, and a profit motive. Um, but, but I think our hope is to de-risk the technology enough where you don't have quality issues or you don't have, have unwanted issues. And it's for society at large to determine how far we want to go with some of these applications, whether it's enhancement or something else. But at this point, we're far from that dialogue. I think at this point, we're just really trying to figure out mm. how do we get to one or two diseases where we can dose patients and see effect and do that in a high quality fashion. We're, we're far from that point, I think. And you made that point as well, John. But we, we should be having these conversations now though, right? I think so, um, <clears throat> and, and they are happening. You know, Katrine started us off with some of the regulatory uh, perspectives. Uh, the FDA, the MEA, uh, these are organizations that are highly engaged in this. This is not some new thing, totally without context, that arrives and that you have to start from the beginning. As, as Professor Church said, though, it's from their perspective, but from your perspective as a scientist, leaving aside the, the regulatory mechanism for a second. Yeah, well, I, I concur with the lists. Uh, Sam does speak for me. We talk about these things. Uh, I, I guess the words I use are benefit risk, which is how any technology uh, for any disease is always thought about. You know, there's there should be some uh, readily demonstrable benefit, and when you have an, a, a new technology, uh, those two need to be thought about really carefully. And so that's why I said earlier, walking out on the benefit-risk balance, I think uh, some of the things that people imagine you could do, uh, we're not ready for yet. And that's not what the companies are going after. That's not what I see academics going after. Mm -hmm. That may come with time, but that is not the objective today. All right. Well. Let's give our panel a very warm round of applause. Thank you very much. You learned a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you.